Hi guys, welcome to the Overdrive Digital Show. We're back after a gap of two weeks and that's because Bert and Rohit have been super busy bringing you the latest reviews, testing cars and awarding the Indian Car of the Year and Motorcycle of the Year. Bert and Rohit have been the esteemed jurors of the iCoti and iMoti for years now. So here's a quick look at the winners from the award ceremony. Now, despite the pandemic having tried its best to slow down the automobile industry, Manufacturers rose to the challenge and launched plenty of new offerings of the nine contenders competing for the coveted title of Indian Car of the Year. The one car that labeled uh, that was labeled to be the best of the rest was the third generation Hyundai i20. In the premium car category of the year, uh, that was introduced for the first time in 2020, the Land Rover Defender was a unanimous choice among the jurors. Keeping an environmentally conscious bend of mind, the, G the Green Car Award category was announced this year. Uh, it was introduced uh, and was awarded to the Tata Nexon EV. And finally, coming to the two-wheeler category, the jurors named the newest member of the Royal Enfield family, the Royal Enfield Meteor 350, as the Indian models Motorcycle of the Year 2021. So congratulations once again to all the winners of the iCoti and iMoti 2021. Now let's switch gears a bit and focus and shift our focus to a German luxury manufacturer, the Mercedes-Benz A-Class sedan or limousine in German speak is the new entry level offering from the brand in India. It fills in the void uh, which was left by the A-Class hatchback and the CLA four-door coupe, but this time around it packs in way more practicality and features that ups its value quotient. Let's find out if the tag of the entry level car is really the right word for the A-Class limousine. Just remember, we have the comments section uh, open now and Bert and Rohit will be joining us shortly. So feel free to ask any of your questions and we'll be back very shortly. the car that I'm driving and you notice the handsome sharp face, you might think this is the Mercedes-Benz CLS. But if you move your perspective to the side of the car, you might notice that the length is not that long, which might make you believe this is the CLA. But then you realize it doesn't have a coupe roof line. So this isn't the CLA, but this is the new entry-level offering from Mercedes-Benz. This is the most economical offering that you can have from Mercedes-Benz in India at the moment. Say hello to the new Mercedes-Benz A-Class sedan or limousine in German speak. It is based on the fourth generation of the A-Class hatchback that debuted internationally in 2018, replaces the CLA in the Indian market and goes up against the likes of the BMW 2 Series. Mercedes-Benz points out that the A-Class limo is the tallest, longest and the roomiest car in its segment. The boot space for the India spec model is down from 420 litres to 405 litres. But the spare wheel will go under the floor and not over it as seen in the CBO model shown here. The pandemic has delayed the arrival of the A Limo into India, but the CLS derived styling makes it a looker. One design feature that I really like is that of the wheels. The design isn't outstanding, it's a very sober, elegant design. But if you look closely at the design of the wheel, you will see that it's also got a nice aerodynamic profile. There are no cuts and creases just for the sake of it. It's actually quite functional too. And because it is 17 inches in size, it also allows for slightly higher profile tyres, which in our scheme of things works quite well. In fact, the headline for the A-Class Limo is its 0.22 coefficient of drag, which is claimed to be the best for any production car so far. I'm really loving the kind of dashboard design and layout that they've managed with this car. Of course, there are some elements like these AC vents that we've seen on cars like the CLS. We've seen this twin screen setup. Uh, these are two 10.25 inch screens. It just looks nice and crisp and it just lifts the mood of the cabin. It doesn't feel like an entry-level product at all and that is what I like about it. Now, some of you would have said, ah, it looks a bit too elegant, it looks a bit too matured with all the wood and leather finish that they've gone in uh, for. They could have given something a little bit more sportier, uh, which I agree. But at the same time, I know that there's the A35 AMG coming in very soon, which will have uh, all those sporty options. 
and I'm hoping that there will be a derivative, an AMG line that might be introduced with uh, this particular car. And when I say AMG line, I'm talking about trimmings, not AMG engines. I hope that there's an AMG trim that is also introduced with this car at a later stage, which will give you more sporty looking appointments in the cabin. The other big feature for the infotainment, of course, is the MBUX. Now, despite this being an entry-level offering from Mercedes-Benz, the MBUX is right up there with the other offerings. Like, for example, we recently drove the GLC, which had the uh, Alexa or uh, Google remote capability where this system would feed certain data to your Alexa or Google home device, uh, and you could retrieve data like vehicle location, fuel status, etc. And all those features are a part of this as well. So, in terms of the tech, Connected tech, it's all there. So it's not like the past where the entry-level offerings from the luxury brands felt or made, made you feel short-changed because they didn't give you the kind of features that you would expect at that price point. Here, however, there's not much that this cabin or this car leaves you wanting for. Now, in the hot and humid weather of Goa right now, I'm really missing a ventilation function on these seats. But otherwise, the seats are nice and supportive. Both the front seats also get a memory function, which is a good thing. Because at the end of the day, this car is primarily aimed at people who are going to drive the car themselves, not people who are going to be driven around. Even with the front passenger seat aligned in line with the driver's seat that was set for a six-footer, the rear bench offers excellent knee room and foot space. The headroom is generous even for a six-footer, and the large window aperture and the panoramic roof complement the airy feel of this cabin. Motivation for the A200 comes by way of a 1.3-litre four-cylinder turbo petrol. And I know a lot of you are going to cringe at the idea of having a 1.3 in a luxury brand. But then let me urge you to think beyond that, think otherwise. Because in today's times where technology is headed, downsized engines are actually able to match the performance of larger engines. In fact, you would have to read the spec sheet or someone would have to tell you that this is a 1.3 for you to know it's a 1.3. The way it performs, the performance or the output or uh, its overall behavior on the road, on the highway, in the city, all of that is on par with what two-litre engines managed not so long ago. In fact, our V-Box numbers show that the A200 is fairly quick off the mark, though about a second slower than the CLA200 petrol that we've tested in the past. But for day-to-day -day use, the engine is nicely tuned for a smooth performance in the city and easy cruising capabilities on the highway. You might raise your eyebrows again if I tell you that we've got a foretaste of this engine in the Renault Duster 1.3 Turbo. Yep, same engine. It impressed us back then and it continues to impress even in this application. This engine was co-developed with Renault and that is where the similarities end. In the A-Class Limo, it runs a different state of tune and is mated to a 7-speed dual-clutch transmission. Unlike older DCTs, the gearbox isn't jerky at city speeds and it is surprisingly quick to respond to varying throttle inputs compared to the older transmission that we had sampled with the CLA. You can fine-tune those responses further by choosing between the Eco, Comfort or Sport modes or by taking manual control using the paddle shifters. Now, despite everything that I've told you so far, I'm very sure there are going to be quite a few souls out there who are still going to be concerned about the size of this engine in this particular car. There are going to be a lot many people out there who are concerned about the reliability of uh, DCT transmissions in our conditions, in our traffic and weather conditions, let's put it that way. So to negate that concern, Mercedes-Benz is offering a massive eight-year warranty on the engine and the gearbox. That is a big deal. Furthermore, if you uh, upgrade to another Mercedes-Benz like most owners do or if you end up selling the A-Class and move to some other brand, no matter what, the warranty gets transferred to the next owner, which ensures further peace of mind for anyone who is shopping in the luxury pre-owned space. The same warranty is also applicable on the diesel. Speaking of which, the A200D uses a 2-litre four-cylinder oil burner that has a humble 150 PS of power but a healthy 320 Newton meters of torque. Thanks to the 17-inch rims, the ride quality is generally quite good. 
Uh, it's not as plush as something like the C-Class. It's a bit firmer than uh, what the C-Class uh, has to offer. So if you want that kind of a plush ride, you might want to upgrade to the C-Class instead. Uh, but this car has a more youthful intent and that is why it's a bit on the firmer side that also gives it nice and taut handling dynamics through the corners. But when I say firm, it's not as firm as something like a BMW 2 Series. It's somewhere in between a 2 Series and a C-Class. And I can't really find any room for complaint here. It's, it's absorbing most of the stuff quite well. It's only at highway speeds that it feels a bit floaty and starts tracking around a little bit. But it's not something that's unnerving. There's a whole lot of safety kit to go with it. So overall, I am quite happy with the kind of ride quality that they've managed for the Indian road conditions. Speaking of safety, the A-Class complements its otherwise progressive brakes with emergency braking assist as well as an automated braking function at city speeds. And should you still unfortunately hit a pedestrian, it will instantaneously pop out the hood to soften the impact. So to sum it up, the A-Class sedan has a kit that surpasses the expectations of this segment set by the competition as well as its own predecessors. In a nutshell, it's a car that first-timers to the brand can brag about beyond the badge on the grille. It can also ferry four idols in a comfortable and dignified way. And the longer warranty packages ensure a higher residual value for the car, which means upgrading from here becomes an easy affair. And for existing customers of the luxury space, the new age design cabin and tech ensures that the A-Class sedan fits well in their garage. Rohit, welcome to the show after two weeks. Yes, thank yes, you so good much. Good evening, guys. The last two weeks have been quite hectic with lots of travel. Last week, I think last weekend, we were actually in Goa and uh, filming all of this back-to-back -back drives, the Renault Tiger and then the A-Class. So, a lot, of, uh, a lot of work going on uh, to get uh, the content out to you. But yeah, uh, so unfortunately, we were also in pretty bad network areas. We've been struggling with network over the last few weeks, so that's why we couldn't come to you with the live show the week, the, the last week and the week before that, prior to that as well. So, so Bert, uh, Bert, uh, you... Yeah, yes, yeah, tell me. Sorry, I was going to say, you've got uh, quite a reputation already. Apoor has already come on uh, online <laughs> to say, <laughs> white seats on the Mercedes, <laughs> expecting a rant about them. <laughs> well, uh, no, I don't have a rant about them. I don't. Uh, it is. It is going to be an issue. And I've said. Uh, I, I'll say this: uh, white seats are going to be a problem for a lot of owners who want to keep their interiors looking brand new, clean. Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, they are going to get dirty, and this is a concern that I have. That's one of the few concerns, actually, one of the very, very few concerns uh, that I have with the A class, uh, and that's just how you know clean you're going to keep the interiors. That's that's going to be a huge challenge. But having said this, uh, at the time of the drives in Goa, I also saw another A-Class with an all-black interior, which I've uh, posted an image of uh, on uh, my Twitter feed. And uh, that interior, to me, I mean, I, I like the way that interior looked. It was much nicer with the black, uh, you know, interior upholstery, uh, black seats, black dashboard, and with certain other accents, uh, so a few of these uh, accessorized bit that Mercedes-Benz is making available to its A-Class owners uh, from carbon fiber looking elements, of course. But uh, it looks very sporty. And I do believe at some, time, at some point in the future, they may come out uh, or they could definitely consider coming out with uh, an A-Class uh, black edition or a night edition or something of that sort, which will uh, you know, kind of get a little more value, a little more attention towards the A-Class once uh, the craze or other the interest for the, the one that's just been launched uh, will kind of or be launched will, uh, will die out. So, uh, yeah, I think the black one made a lot more sense, but uh, the white ones, of course, uh, with this two-tone thing with the wood paneling and the white upholstery also is quite an impressive thing. By the way, Rohit, this, this particular A-Class, uh, this is the this is the Z177, uh, if I'm not here, the Z177. That's the long wheel based version that is sold exclusively in China. You don't get this version anywhere else in the world. There is a shorter wheel based okay. version than this that's sold in uh, the rest of the world, Europe and America. Uh, and this is exclusively made in China. So I would uh, believe that some of these kits are coming in from China, that's manufactured in China. I think these kits that most of these are assembling here in India will come from uh, China. But yeah, it's it's uh, still a fantastic car. The uh, the 1.3, the petrol, the brilliant engine. So really you missed out my portion when I talked about the diesel as well. We have got that also. 
and i believe yeah we do uh, it's a longer it's, review it's on it's, it's on the longer it's review on it's on youtube it's on youtube longer review on youtube and uh, of course on the show but uh, yeah uh, it, this is about a second uh, point sorry point to one second uh, of a difference between the 2000 terms of outright performance the petrol just being 0.1 second quicker than the 2 liter diesel so quite an amazing engine also this 1.3 is a fantastic engine uh, yeah like rohit mentioned in the story for the series benz uh but in a completely different state of tune uh, from series and the kind of refinement uh, and the kind of uh, responsiveness that you get from this engine is just uh, is brilliant uh having said that i definitely like the top curb on the diesel uh, the 2 liter diesel also it's a tried and tested engine it, it powers almost everything uh, in the series benz's range uh, it's almost a, a few years old but it's still one of the finest engines they make Uh, and it's an absolute pleasure to drive uh, the A class with the diesel engine. All right, we can All take right. all those questions. Yes, actually, we have uh, one from Mayur as well. Mayur wants to know when will Audi uh, bring the A3, given that uh, BMW and Mercedes have already uh, bought in uh, their cars. Well, we will we will have uh, something on the A3 also very shortly. Uh, I think that is one of the lineups for the, this year updations to that car also. So that will happen uh, in 2021. Uh, Audi has anyways promised us a huge pool of cars coming out, some updates uh, and some new ones as well. And one of them, Rohit has got some information on uh, something that's coming up uh, very very shortly, which actually Audi has leaked out uh, to everyone, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I think let's let's no. wait uh, till we till we move to the other oh, relevant the review uh, and the other <laughs> yeah relevant car and then we'll talk about right. uh, that as well. But uh, yeah, I think the A3 uh, is the only one missing here uh, from the pack, and uh, they have an updated A3 out in the market. Uh, looks very much like the new A4 that we reviewed at the beginning of this year, and uh, it certainly looks much better than the uh, than the older car. So. I think now would be a very good time for Audi to bring in the A3 because uh, the competition is Just all so here. Just so that we can do the comparison. And so that we can do the comparison as well, and tell you which is which is the sedan to go for if you are still looking for a sedan in that kind of a price bracket. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, it should be an exciting uh, comparison with all these three cars together. I think it's fantastic uh, the kind of space that you get inside the A class. Also, it's absolutely brilliant uh, for a car True. that's small, that compact. You don't really think about it in terms of being a very large uh, or a lengthy car. You, from certain angles, I think it kind of reminded me also about uh, how the Chevy Cruze used to look. It's got that kind of a stance, nice muscular haunches, very beefy on the outside, uh, but still compact and you no know, manageable sizing. But then you step into the cabin and you've got this absolutely uh, fantastically spaced cabin. There's enormous amounts of uh, knee room for the rear passengers, good shoulder space. the one challenge of course uh, the, the other drawback that i that, that i know the a class uh, will have and uh, this is the mercedes kind of uh, uh, has a bit of a challenge with all of their cars is that transmission tunnel that you can see you can see the drive train tunnel going right there under the aircon vent uh, in that's that's a raised uh, element inside the rail and inside the cabin and that kind of splits the cabin into two distinct portions the left and the right portion so a third passenger sitting in the middle will always find it a bit challenging to place their feet comfortably and over long distances it can be uncomfortable and this is essentially because mercedes benz also does the four wheel drive version of this there is uh, the four wheel drive version of sold in europe and which will be sold in europe in after in these conditions and i think that is uh, that's where the pop shock kind of uh, you know uh, powers the rear axle and that's why that transmission that transmission tunnel exists over there uh, i think the series could have done Could have tried to uh, take have taken that out, have made a little more value for people who are sitting in the rear bench. But otherwise, this is a very comfortable four seater, but a fifth can also squeeze in. Right. Okay. In fact, we talking are... of uh, sorry, sorry, Soini. So, in fact, talking of the all wheel drive uh, that you just mentioned, but uh, there is the A thirty five. Uh, which is coming yes. to India. It will be launched alongside yeah. this A class, uh, the A two hundred and the A two twenty. But uh, yeah, I mean that that is the one with the formatic. Uh, in fact, that's the, that's a quick glimpse of uh, the A thirty five, and this is not B roll. Uh, this is footage that we've shot uh, that essentially tells you that we have been driving this car. Uh, in fact, that review will be up very soon. The text review is already out on Overdrive dot in for any one of you who would like to read. Uh, the video will uh, be out uh, soon as well. Uh, so yeah, we have this review coming up, and the A thirty five will be launched alongside the regular, the standard uh, A class that we just showed you on uh, on this particular show. So both these cars uh, will launch together. Uh, 
and the good news is uh, in fact we've just been told today that uh, the li the likely price uh, for the a35 is going to be about 60 lakh rupees uh, that i think is a very very nice uh, price tag uh, that essentially means that you could uh, have yourself this car under 75 lakh rupees on road and as per our test figures uh, you know even in our conditions and our fuel uh, the car manages to go from not to 100 in under 5 seconds so if you look at the specs, uh, if you are that kind of a guy who loves uh, to brag about specs as well, or that kind of a girl who loves to brag about specs as well, uh, you know, uh, 0 to 100 in less than 5 is very quick. And in fact, under 75 lakh rupees, uh, if you're talking about getting yourself a brand new uh, sporty car like this, uh, this could be the only car that gives you a 0 to 100 under 5 seconds. So that's uh, one interesting bit about the A35. And otherwise, it's an excellent car to drive. Like I said, the review is already out on Overdrive.in, so definitely do check it out. All right. Uh, we'll take in another question. Uh, Nitin Joshua wants to know, would OD prefer the Volkswagen Group's 1.5 uh, TSI with the DSG in the car or the T-Roc or the 1.3 with, uh, with the DCT in the A-Class uh, limousine? In fact, Nitin, uh, I'm let, going to let Bert take this question. Uh, the only reason why I did not answer it uh, when you had posted this question on one of our reviews uh, is that uh, you know I was saving it for uh, this particular show and I want to know Bert's uh, opinion on this because... Uh, he has recently given the 1.5 TS, uh, TSI with the DSG, if I'm not wrong, uh, in uh, well, the, the camouflaged uh, uh, Kusha. So yeah. uh, what would you take uh, about between the two? It's, it's an interesting question. So interestingly, here's what happened. Uh, on the Kusha drive, that 1.5 DCT had some issues. Apparently, there were some concerns with, it, uh, with the intercooler and the car wasn't performing to the, the best way possible. But nonetheless, it was a good engine. It's a great engine for that matter. I'm not going to dismiss that engine very easily. Uh, it's, it's got some very great performance. Uh, but having driven the A-Class uh, and driven it uh, reasonably well for that matter, I think the 1.3 in the A-Class is without a doubt the better engine. It's it's not just the power and performance that it is capable of. It's the kind of refinement that it provides, uh, the kind of smoothness that you get, uh, the, the kind of responsive the responses that are there, you know, they're instantaneous. And this is a small, compact engine. Uh, it's one of the smallest engines the series when it makes. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's an absolute gem to kind of drive this and to see what it is capable of doing. We've got over 160 horsepower. The same configuration can go almost up to about 200 horsepower. So that's, that's an enormous amount of power coming out of this uh, this motor. And it's a single turbocharger at the end of the day. Keep that in mind. It's not a twin turbocharged uh, engine, but it's a single turbocharged engine, uh, four cylinder. Uh, and, and, and it's just phenomenal kind of performance that you get uh, out of this. So yeah, I think the 1.3 uh, uh, Mercedes engine is uh, it's something uh, that uh, can be enjoyed thoroughly. However, uh, the 1.5 from Volkswagen as well is not bad at all. I think there's a lot of potential in that. I'm actually waiting to drive the push out uh, when it comes out. You only to see one, one of the reasons being to see how just how well does that engine uh, match it because it's going to be serving a lot of other cars in the Volkswagen uh, fleet as well. So, yes, there's a lot of potential in that engine as well, but I'd like to get a better opinion of it. Uh, right. In fact, yeah, that engine did impress us in the car oak as well. And uh, even I'm waiting yeah. to see how it uh, manages, uh, you know, inside that uh, tinier package uh, that uh, the Kushak is. Uh, certainly, I'm, I'm, I mean, I have a lot of uh, hopes from that engine, but uh, just the way Bert said or what I said in my review as well, the 1.3 from Mercedes doesn't feel like a 1.3 unless someone tells you it's a 1.3. If you were uh, to directly go for a drive uh, in that car, it almost feels like a two-liter engine uh, that uh, you know uh, you drove maybe three, four years ago. So uh, it's it's that good. So definitely do take a test drive of uh, uh, these cars, uh, you know, before making any judgments uh, based on uh, the spec sheets purely. Okay, uh, guys, we'll I just, think we can uh... take one more question. I think we take one more question, Sony. That's an interesting question, right. uh, which Autotech Space has put up, uh, which is, do you think Hyundai small one liter turbo petrol is overhyped? The one which does duty in Verna I-20 with 120 bhp, 170 Nm meter top. Diesel that comes in both these cars are actually more powerful and faster. Uh, you're right, uh, Autotech Space. Uh, that's, that's, an, that's an interesting question. Uh, because turbo petrols, keep in mind, we're talking about efficiency at the same time as performance uh, and power. And uh, the the smaller engine, the 1.2, is the more efficient of these engines. Uh, also, because it's a small capacity engine, it has it, it, you got about 120 uh, horsepower. You've got about uh, 170 newton meters of torque. 
uh, which is an enormous amount of power and torque output for a small engine which serves in a smaller car. Now, in the same engine, what we put in a larger car like Mercedes Benz, keep in mind, Mercedes tweaked and tuned their engine, the 1.3 liter engine, that delivers you, delivers about 160, 170 horsepower in the A class. So it's not difficult to go all the way up to that, but then just make it more far more expensive uh, to own an I20 or a Verna, or for that matter, even uh, the Venio. Whereas uh, you know you put that uh, the 1.2 the compact engine, the uh, double petrol engine. So it is a good engine. It uh, it works well. Uh, both Kia and uh, Hyundai will be using this engine in the future. Downsizing definitely is the order of the day. So you need for petrol engine. We definitely need smaller engines in smaller cars, which are far more efficient, which match emission regulations around the country, for that matter, uh, without affecting the performance uh, that you would want in a car of this order. So, yes, uh, and keep in mind, the I-20, uh, the 1.2 the petrol, turbo petrol is one of the most powerful engines in that segment as well. Now, diesels that come in both these cars, yes, they're also larger diesels. They are they generate a lot more torque uh, and uh, are they more faster? Not necessarily, but they definitely generate a lot more talk in that sense, and they've, they've definitely got the advantage of having better drivability at the end of the day. But uh, apart from that, uh, they're both they're both good engines. If I had to settle on one, I I mean I'm a, I'm a diesel guy. At the end of the day, I like the 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 the, the top band that these cars offer, the kind of drivability that they offer. It's simpler for me to just leave it in fourth gear, or you know, without having to downshift constantly to get back into the power band, which is one of the uh, which is one of the downsides of a petrol engine. You constantly have to downshift uh, to get into the power band and, and, and extrude that kind of power, the kind of power that you would want, which diesels don't have to do very often. So that's, that's the difference, and that's one of the reasons why I prefer the diesels over the petrol. And also, it's not about uh, the power and, uh, you know, the uh, which engine is faster, because maybe it matters to uh, you, me, Bert, Sohini, uh, and maybe 2% and 5% maybe of the market. But uh, the larger audience out there obviously wants better efficiency. They want better pricing. And in the even larger scheme of things, the manufacturers also have to uh, sort of adhere to a particular uh, emissions number, right? They have to uh, go be, uh, below that and not uh, keep on exceeding that. So uh, these engines certainly run cleaner than their diesel counterparts. And uh, that is what the whole idea of these engines is, that they are... They are not only cleaner, but they're also efficient uh, while being uh, small on the size and on the pocket in uh, in that sense. So uh, to answer your question in a uh, in a very short manner, no, I don't think they're overhyped. Uh, it all depends on, uh, you know, what are you expecting out of that engine? Yes, they're over-marketed, let's put it that way, with the whole turbo badging and, uh, you know, made to sound like they are the sportier variant, though they aren't. Uh, you know, uh, even if you uh, rewind uh, a little uh, into the past and you look at uh, even the Ford EcoSport, where they did the EcoBoost engine of a similar capacity, uh, you know, uh, essen uh, essentially, it was it was something similar, but it never really delivered on the fuel economy. It was uh, not great on the economy because its tuning for the Indian traffic conditions uh, wasn't really that great. But now, if you look, uh, you know, closer to what we are, where we are today with these engines, or even what Volkswagen is doing with the one liter TSI, uh, you know, technology has really uh, uh, advanced quite a bit. These engines, despite their size and spec, have become very efficient. Uh, they are a lot more drivable than what they were before. Uh, like Bert said, yeah, you might have to drop a gear uh, every now and then compared to a diesel. Uh, but compared to what, uh, you know, the older petrol engines managed, even the 1.2s or the 1.5s, where you would have to rev quite a bit, uh, you know, to get uh, the car going, or you have to keep the engine on the boil when you're uh, on uh, winding roads in the mountains or even on the highways. All that is not required with these new smaller turbocharged engines. They are tuned uh, that well to be able to deliver all this performance while at the same time giving you good efficiency as well. Uh, so essentially, that's the whole target of these engines, giving you good efficiency, same kind of performance, being lower on the price, and at the same time meeting those emission standards, uh, You know, making the cars cleaner. That's what the idea of these engines is. It's not necessarily about uh, going faster or being more powerful uh, than their diesel counterparts. All right, we'll just hit the pause button on the questions for a bit. We'll answer the remaining ones and you guys can keep sending us your questions. Uh, just going back to the A-Class on the sidelines of the A-Class limousine drive, Bert also caught up with Santosh Ayer, uh, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Mercedes-Benz India. Here's what uh, they have planned uh, for India. 
Santosh, you've got the A-Class coming into India. What is the intent behind getting a product out in that particular segment? I think, you know, but we invented that segment way back in 2013 with the A-Class uh, hatch. You know, that was a CBU, then we got the B-Class, then we had the GLA and the CLA. So we, we had a couple of products in that segment. And to give you some numbers, we have done some 22,000 cars in the last five, six years. So it's, it's, a, it's a big segment for us. And for the last one year, of course, because of various reasons, we couldn't uh, have any product there. So there was a sense of vacuum. Uh, coming to the A-Class, uh, for us, it's a big thing because, uh, you know, with the CLA experience, we knew that the customer wants a bit of practicality also, a better headroom, uh, luggage space, at, at the same time styling. And with this new trend of connectivity, we said A-Class is the perfect package for India. So, therefore, our decision to go with localizing A-Class for the Indian market was done a couple of years back. And I think now it's time this car now comes to India and let's see how this goes. So, you mentioned uh, the A-Class will be replacing the CLA, you know, so that is one of your entry-level cars. Uh, but uh, what's the idea over there? Uh, I mean, you've given up uh, style and design for a more practical package? Uh, yeah, but uh, we have actually two types of customers in this segment. One, we call it as a luxury dweller. You know, these are customers who have multiple luxury cars in their family and they buy the A-Class basically for their son, daughter or even for their spouse as such as an additional car in the family. And that's one big piece. And then we have the first time buyers who come into this segment. So the, for a car, it has to meet both these segment profiles. And even for the luxury customers, they go with family sometimes. They go with friends outside on long drives, come to say Goa or anywhere else. So they needed space. And uh, so with the CLA, uh, I think uh, it was stylish, which the new A-Class is. Uh, and also, you know, when you look at the aerodynamics, when you look at the overall car styling, it, it meets the style quotient. Uh, and then you add a tinge of space inside the boot space uh, and the connectivity. So I think that's much better package for India for us. Uh, therefore, this decision to come with the A-Class uh, replacing the CLA. That's an interesting moniker because you've got the limousine attached now to the A-Class. It's not just the A-Class sedan any longer. Uh, so, you know, what, what was the intent behind that? What's the kind of ideology that, uh, you know, uh, are you you're trying to draw the customer into by using the word limousine? I think for us, we have to, uh, for uh, the communication is clear that this is a full-blown luxury car without a compromise because it's not just a compact car uh, as such. And when I say without a compromise, uh, that's why I said it's it doesn't have any entry-level variants. It's a full-fledged limousine. It has ample space uh, when you drive the car, even for the rear uh, passengers. The headroom is there. The luggage space is there. So that's why, uh, just to be clear, we want we use the word limousine so that it's a full-fledged car and not any compromise there. So what kind of a pricing can we expect uh, on the A class on those, uh, how affordable is it going to be? See, as I said, uh, there is no entry-level model here. So the model that we will launch will be fully spec uh, with all the features, connectivity, Mercedes Me Connect, everything as standard in the car. So what we would like to look at, focus is more on the value. So uh, we would be pricing, uh, right now we have opened bookings around 42 lakhs, so definitely that's an indication we will be premium priced uh, for sure in the segment. But I think the overall value proposition is much better with a better cost of ownership. Uh, I would say the end of life cycle, RVs, etc. is much better. So when somebody looks at a full package, I think it's a very good value. Now we've got the A-Class coming in, you've got the A35, uh, the AMG is uh, going to be there in the market. Localizing it, uh, that's, is, that, uh, the end, is that the idea behind the A35 as well, that you can localize it get it more affordable, make it accessible to a lot more people who want that kind of performance and uh, dynamics. Yes, it's the second AMG now that we will produce in India. Uh, after the GLC 43 AMG, that's been a roaring success. So I think that, that shows that localization of performance cars, there are customers, enthusiasts who want these cars also, uh, but of course at a lower price and the localization definitely helps us and the A35 will be the first car uh, in the series of cars that we will be launching on the AMG line. A-Class is one of the products, uh, you've also mentioned about you know the local assembly, the uh, uh, and uh, product producing it over here, but that's also one of the products that's going to come along with this is the GLA, which is the SUV. Uh, how are you integrating both of these products into your uh, manufacturing facilities? Yeah, the best part of our Chakan facility is it's flexible. So, you know, we can add multiple model lines and the plant is able to produce it. In the same line, we can make the GLS and maybe even, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, something like the GLA or even the GLC, for example. So, that's the flexibility of the plant. In terms of capacity, we have an installed capacity of 20,000 which can go up to 40,000 and now it's up to the market also to expand. Uh, we were close to 15,000 odd cars a couple of years back, uh, two years back, then of course last year is an aberration and from now on to forward we look at a double digit growth every year. So as we grow, I think we have the capacity, uh, we have the investments, we have just done an equity infusion also into our uh, plant. So I think we are ready, uh, we now expect the market also to grow uh, to take care of uh, the future investments or uh, production requirements.
All right. In case you joined us uh, in between, this uh, interview is going to be up on our Overdrive website as well as on the YouTube channel shortly. Uh, but there is uh, sorry. Ma- sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, before you start off, uh, sorry, there's one point that I want to make over here again. In the A class, we've seen just a few, few shots just now of the boot where you saw the space saver that was on top of the, uh, on the, on top of the uh, sitting inside the boot. Uh, but that is not how the layout is going to be. Mercedes then is going to be offering a full size uh, spare tire and that will be placed under the boot uh, lid, the boot cover for that matter, uh, which will not be visible any longer. So you will get the full uh, right, which is one of the questions that I had asked uh, the product guys at Mercedes when they were claiming over 400 liters of boot space, but with that spare tire, this is an issue in the most manufacturer space. With the boot uh, placed, the with the sorry, with the spare tire placed in the boot, even if it's a space saver, it occupies almost 50% of the space, and whatever is left is just not useful enough. But Mercedes-Benz came back saying that uh, that uh, space saver uh, will will be uh, will be positioned under uh, the covers, so it will it will give you the full uh, use and the extent of that boot, uh, the full 430 liters or so that uh, is available in the class will be completely uh, can be completely utilized. All right, uh, but we have Mayur Singh with models like the A35 and the GLC 43. They are destroying what AMGs were. Do you agree with what he has to say? Uh, I don't think so, Mayur. Uh, making smaller, more compact uh, AMGs for that matter, or rather extending the AMG ethos to some of the other cars, the more affordable side, uh, opens up that end of the market to everybody. Now, not everybody can afford a four crore or a six crore AMG for that matter. You can't all go out and buy GTs. Uh, but you would definitely like to see what AMG is capable of doing. You want that kind of engineering, you want that kind of performance. So uh, this is how it, it kind of you get more people into the fold. You get them more enthused about uh, you know uh, some of the halo brands that uh, various manufacturers have got, whether it's uh, Mercedes with the AMG, whether it's BMW with the M division, whether it's Audi with their uh, S and the RS uh, uh, you know line of cars. Uh, you have to expand this everywhere. Keep in mind, I mean some of the more premium and more prestigious brands globally, also for that matter. I mean Lamborghini made a made an SUV. Bentley made an SUV, Rolls Royce made an SUV. So what what do we, we want? The manufacturers want more people to, uh, you know, uh, embrace the brand. They definitely need, I mean, as a commitment to their shareholders as well, you definitely need a lot of customers coming in. You need to be sales at the end of the day. And the only way you can do this is by, yes, at some level, there is some amount of dilution. I definitely, I won't deny that. There is some amount of dilution that happens. But uh, look at it as an affordable car, as an A-class. Uh, I can get a little more focus performance out of it, I can get slightly better dynamics out of it, if that's what I'm looking for. If I wanted a sportier version, the closest thing I could buy would have been a C63, and which is a crore plus. So, I mean, how do I enjoy what uh, the AMG brand represents and stands for? You know, this is the only way they can do that and get more people uh, to understand what it means to have high performance cars. All right. Uh, up next, we have a question from Suresh. He wants to know that the third five door was officially announced. By Mahindra, when can we expect that on road? Well, Suresh, there, this plan for the five-door car uh, has been going on for quite some time. And this is right since the time we actually drove the car where we committed to having a five-door version of it also, uh, which means extending the wheelbase, lengthening it a bit, and then coming out of that version. This will also be the first time that Mahindra would have done something like this. Keep in mind the previous generation part, there wasn't a five-door version. I'm hoping it comes in somewhere where it could replace probably the Bolero uh, and be a little more utilitarian in that sense uh, with the kind of space and comfort that you would want a contemporary SUV with for a larger family. Uh, the car as it stands right now, it's not, it, the car kind of is in a very, very niche bracket and a Fido version will give it a little more roominess, will give it a little more space, will make it accessible to a larger audience. And I do believe Mahindra should have done that first. They should have come up with a Fido version of it before coming out with a Fido version and that would have definitely opened up the market uh, a lot more. Having said that, they still need to, Mahindra still needs to uh, uh, to, to streamline the production uh, facilities. They, have, they are facing uh, certain challenges essentially with uh, certain commodities, certain products, certain elements in their uh, vehicles that has to be imported from the comes from overseas. And deliveries are, uh, are a bit of an issue at this point in time. The entire supply chain is facing problems. Uh, at the same time, they weren't uh, expecting the kind of volumes that they, that the demand that the car has created for them. 
and uh, that also is kind of they try to ramp up production for it. But yes, the the waiting period is extremely long. There is an uh, and that is that is going to exist for a little while longer. If Mahindra has to order, has to add the five door to it as well, you can just imagine just how much longer that waiting period is going to be. Uh, so I think they will take their time with this and probably within a year. Keep in mind, uh, as the other rest of the products goes, uh, there's an update on the KUV, the XUV, uh, 300, there's uh, the new XC 500 coming in, and of course, the new Scorpio as well is going to be coming in. And these are the three product lines that will be uh, that the focus will be on uh, in the short term. And I guess somewhere in that uh, in that period, is where the Fido power will also come in. So expect some more news about it coming out later towards the year, towards uh, the end of 2021. All right, Rohit, we have a question here for you. Uh, Yash wants to buy a scooter, a 125cc scooter for his uh, parents. He is looking for more space on the footboard to keep cartons uh, uh, as his uh, dad has a herbal business for deliveries. What would you suggest? Okay, Yash, first and foremost, I would suggest don't do that, uh, you know, get some sort of a, a storage space uh, or maybe, you know, one of those uh, big pannier boxes at the back that will certainly make it safer uh, because, uh, you know, keeping it at the footboard, uh, it's not a safe option to go with. Uh, it's certainly not, uh, you know, uh, where you would want to want your parents to risk their life uh, and limb uh, doing this. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in terms of performance, if you're looking, uh, looking at a 125, uh, I would still suggest going in for something like the Activa because in terms of the overall space, uh, it offers quite a bit of it, including, uh, uh, you know, the seat space and the storage space. Uh, the other option that you could look at is uh, the TVS Jupiter. I would ask you to, uh, you know, uh, go between these two, take a test ride of both, uh, get them to test ride both these vehicles, see what they are uh, more comfortable with in terms of the ergonomics. Uh, because both these uh, you know scooters are also very closely matched of course there's the access one to five as well uh, but i find uh, it to be not as comfortable as a jupiter and that's the reason why uh, i would go with a jupiter uh, or an activa because again the activa is uh, proven to be india's uh, most favorite uh, scooter uh, so essentially that also ensures better service better resale value and all those things so uh, you know it, it's just better peace of mind uh, if you were to go with an activa is what i would say uh, but my choice would be the Jupiter. So, like I said, between the Activa and the Jupiter, uh, get them to test ride both, and you should be able to make a more informed choice. All right. Uh, here's so one. Tony, we've got one. Please, we've got one viewer who wants a shout out. Neeraj Tiwari. Hi, Neeraj. Thanks for watching. And do keep uh, <laughs> following us. Do keep watching the digital show. Come back with the few questions that you might also have. Any doubts that you've got, we're there to clear them. So, again, Neeraj Tiwari, hello. <laughs> hello. Hi, Neeraj. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're still around <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Anish, uh, uh, Anish Thomas has an interesting question. Uh, he says that most of his previous questions were around uh, EVs because he wants his first vehicle to be electric. To start small, which two-wheeler should he go for in Delhi? The Ether 450X or the TVS iCube? He also says, should he wait for the launch of the Suzuki Bergman Street Electric, the Hero uh, e uh, Maestro Honda PCX Electric uh, or the Bajaj Shetak in Delhi? Uh, well, Anish, uh, you know, one thing that uh, a lot of you hate us for, this motoring journalist, uh, uh, you know, where you hate us for, is uh, where we... Yeah, we actually <laughs> ask you to keep waiting, keep waiting, keep waiting for the next new product. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to ask you to wait for any of those uh, vehicles that you've mentioned. Uh, let's talk about the TVS iCube uh, and the 450X. Uh, if I was buying uh, between the two, I would go with the 450X uh, purely because uh, one, we haven't compared the two motorcycle, uh, the two uh, EVs yet. Uh, but uh, you know, the 450X just looks a lot more promising. It looks very cool. I think the iCube is still, uh, you know, it's a little too. Uh, sci-fi for me. I mean, I don't want to uh, ride around on a scooter that looks so outlandish. Uh, so that's my only grudge with it. Uh, but I haven't uh, ridden that scooter yet, so I can't really talk much about the performance. But the 450X, uh, that's certainly an excellent product. I mean, it looks nice. It looks fresh. It looks uh, new without looking outlandish. And uh, I mean, everyone that we've spoken to so far who have uh, used these uh, vehicles, they're happy with, uh, you know, the performance of an Aether and the overall uh, service that they get uh, for their scooter. Uh, so, yeah, if uh, Aether does manage to set up a good, uh, you know, network around you, uh, this is uh, the scooter that I would recommend for you. And it's a, it's a very noble thought. It's a very nice thought uh, that you want your first vehicle to be an EV. Uh, so, you know, we'll definitely support that. And I think you should go with the 450X. 
and anish let's not forget they've also ramped up their production uh, at the new uh, facility in hosur tamil nadu plus the network is expanding so it's a great brand to be uh, backing as well so it's a interesting choice to make uh, but yeah, another interesting is, point another interesting point is both tvs and ethar are producing in the same region and yes, i wonder yeah. if that yeah. is going to become the next hub hosur is going to be the next hub for all ev makers for that matter who uh, who going to be talking down there and uh, coming down Keep in mind uh, again, Bangalore and that part of uh, the thing is then the state of Karnataka is getting a, is getting into the news a lot, principally because a lot of EV uh, players are, st- are, are st- uh, stepping into that state. And recently, or actually a couple of months ago, uh, my dad, in fact, was very proud to say this. We, I, he heard that Tesla also is looking to come down uh, to uh, Karnataka, and uh, and the chief minister was uh, had invited them over to. Uh, look at the locations and to identify a place. And the uh, rumors are that Tesla is coming. Up, Tesla was also looking at some space closer to Mangalore, for that matter, Mangalore City, uh, to set up a production base. If it does well, uh, yeah, that's it. I'm going to leave my job probably and go and join Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> Become the India Communication Officer. You you heard that you're first. Everybody heard and that I, you're I, first. And I won't and I and I won't communicate with anybody because that's what Tesla does best. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Elon Musk. <laughs> All right, uh, but no, uh, fact, honest... I mean, which is which is a fact. Sorry, I, mean, I have, which is a fact. I have absolutely no idea who's in the communications team, who's marketing, who's sales. You have nobody has any idea anywhere around the world uh, on who's uh, the you know who are these various uh, heads and various officials are working uh, with Tesla for that matter. But wherever we decide to, if, if at all, is join Tesla, Bert, and uh, if there is an opportunity to uh, get a seat on the next SpaceX uh, uh, program, <laughs> definitely do count me in. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to, I'm ready to, ready to fly we, out. We would as, all be on as some list. As well. yeah. <laughs> we'll be in some waiting list. Bert would have forgotten about us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but uh, honest words wants to know: Is buying a new IC engine car practical considering the fuel hike and future mobility? Well, uh, let's let's assume that uh, for a moment that uh, the government is working towards reducing fuel prices. Uh, apart from just playing the blame game and saying states should also reduce fuel taxes, and so the center also will. I think someone needs to take a stand over here first and make the first move and reduce taxes on uh, petrol price on fuel prices, whether it's petrol or diesel for that matter, and make it more affordable. Uh, but having said that, yes, it's not exactly cheap at this point in time. It's expensive, and does buying an IC engine car. A practical choice, uh, not really. But what are you going to do? Uh, I am, uh, for instance, uh, I am not willing to use public transport at this point in time. At least until the pandemic uh, is still on and uh, people haven't been vaccinated thoroughly, and uh, we are all back to a normal uh, life. So I'm not willing. I'm not willing to risk uh, heading out into public transport, whether it's Mumbai's local trains or buses, for that matter. I just wouldn't want to use them. Uh, to commute to my place of work or anywhere else for that matter. So the only choice I've got left with me is a two-wheeler or four-wheeler. Uh, a two-wheeler in Mumbai City is uh, is just doesn't make sense to me. I understand the need for it, but uh, I'm not willing to risk uh, life and limb heading out on a two-wheeler and competing with uh, various uh, with the uh, thousands of other or other lakhs of other two-wheelers on Mumbai's roads, all of whom are on a suicide mission every day. Uh, so yeah, I prefer buying a car. Uh, it may not be the most practical option, but uh, it is the safest, uh, most sanitized option that I would have at uh, in this day and age at this point in time. Maybe in the future, fuel prices will come down, and it just make a lot more sense to keep buying cars. But uh, let's see, or maybe EVs will come in in a much bigger way and play a much larger role in society. So let's let's hope for the day actually when EVs start coming in, uh, more EVs start coming in. We've got a lot of EVs coming in in various segments. Uh, initially, we're going to see a lot of expensive electric vehicles coming in. Uh, I mean, the most uh, recent, or uh, the newest one that's going to be coming in uh, is uh, is Volvo stepping into this space as well. The new EV will have information for you very, very shortly. Another week is when, uh, uh, inside a week, in fact, is when they're going to make uh, they're going to announce uh, plans to launch uh, their EV. But uh, people are going to, there, there are more premium players coming in first. Once acceptance increases with that, we will see a lot more uh, manufacturers. Uh, bringing in a lot more affordable uh, electric vehicles. We will come to that bone of contention. Also, there is a very interesting conversation. Uh, those of you waiting for a rant from me, well, I'm warming up to it, <laughs> and this is what to be the Tata Nexon EV. 
So we will we'll come back to it in a, in a few minutes. All right, uh, guys, keep those questions coming. We'll quickly go through uh, the news from this week since we were talking about uh, electric vehicles as the first uh, bit of concern. Uh, following a customer complainant uh, claiming that his Nexon EV has never returned a range of over 200 kilometers despite dealer uh, intimated uh, advice on the use of EVs and the ARI certified range of 200 uh, kilometers. Sorry, for the Nexon EV being 312 kilometers, the Delhi government has delisted the Tata Nexon EV from its list of cars that are eligible for its subsidy on electric vehicles. The Delhi government provides a rebate of uh, 10,000 rupees per, kil per kilowatt hour of battery capacity up to a maximum of 1.5 lakh rupees. Uh, the Nexon EV in its XZ Plus variant was eligible for this benefit. Tata Motors has responded to this allegation saying that the ARAI figure is a proven figure achieved under standards set by the law and that Nexon EV also meets the minimum 140 kilometer range needed for four wheelers to meet the FAME 2 subsidy guidelines. The company went on to say that the range is affected by various factors like the use of AC, driving style, driving modes, traffic conditions and other real world factors. But Rohit, your views on this matter given that range anxiety of course is a very valid uh, concern. And this is the most affordable EV that you can buy in the country today. So the complaints, as far as I know, is from two customers. Where, what are your uh, views on this? Well, I think, uh, but I'll go first. Uh, I have, I have two, uh, you know, uh, two areas of concern here. One, I think, uh, is that uh, with just two complaints, uh, should they have taken such a harsh decision? I don't think so. They shouldn't have. Uh, because uh, even if uh, the customers said that they're barely getting 200 uh, kilometers range, which ideally is what uh, I think the next one should uh, give. That's what we said in our review as well, uh, where we uh, got a little over 100, but that was with our kind of testing and a completely different kind of driving. And we said that 200 was possible. Uh, so if uh, they're getting somewhere around 200, it is still a sizable figure. Uh, it's still uh, within the guidelines uh, that were set uh, in place by Fame too. So I don't know, uh, you know, why they would want to uh, take a negative step like this uh, at this point of time. Uh, that is one uh, concern. Uh, the second concern is uh, I'm not very sure about ARAI's testing procedure here. Uh, you know, I'm I'm saying that out loud here because. Uh, uh, I remember speaking to some people at Hyundai, off the record, of course, uh, where uh, even they were a little concerned with the figure that ARI came back with uh, for the Kona. And they were concerned about advertising that figure because that was a very optimistic figure. And uh, it was nowhere close to the NEDC uh, uh, figures that uh, the Kona claims uh, in the European Union. Uh, and they were a little concerned about uh, advertising that because of uh, exactly this. They don't want customers to be misguided by uh, these kind of advertisements or these kind of uh, certifications. Because, uh, you know, especially given that electric uh, vehicles uh, have, uh, you know, introduced us to this new term called uh, range anxiety, uh, which is very much true. Uh, you know, you you don't want to be uh, starting off uh, with a wrong set of expectations. And I think that is where the ARI, ARI needs to uh, sort of rethink uh, the whole, uh, you know, testing procedure and uh, the, the figure that they are giving out. I think they need to, uh, need to be a little uh, bit uh, more realistic uh, than optimistic here. Uh, because we've seen that in, uh, uh, in petrol and diesel cars as well. Uh, you know, we've never got uh, 27 and 28 kilometers to a liter that manufacturers still uh, claim to be, uh, you know, possible on some of the four wheelers. I mean, I have not driven a car that has given that kind of fuel economy with the regular driving. And though the area doesn't do this on a simulator anymore, they are actually putting cars out in the open and testing this. Uh, these figures, uh, you know, uh, they still uh, seem a, a little too optimistic to me uh, if I were to compare it to anything that I have tested for the last 10, 12 years. So, uh, it's the same thing with the electric vehicle. So these are the two concerns for me uh, that on the basis of two complaints, they shouldn't have taken such a hard, hard step because uh, like we saw uh, Anish also mentioning that he wants his first vehicle to uh, be, be an EV. Someone else asking us, uh, you know, uh, uh, why don't I go for an EV? Is petrol or diesel still making sense? So people are warming up uh, to the idea of going with an electric. And this kind of, uh, you know, uh, introducing a, a particular subsidy or uh, or a uh, incentivization uh, scheme for EVs and then just taking it away uh, so so immediately. Uh, that sort of uh, just, you know, dampens the spirit for people who actually are willing to make that change, who are actually willing to go the EV route. Uh, so this is a matter of concern for me and the area certainly needs to uh, look into how they are uh, testing these vehicles and what kind of figures they are coming out with because each and every figure, be it an internal combustion engine or an EV, is just sounding a little too optimistic uh, to be achieved in the real world. Your so, um, 
my thoughts. Okay, I've got a lot of thoughts on this. So here's my <laughs> there comes the rant. Uh, next on EV thing, but uh, I won't actually start off with the rant. But what I first like to tell all of you guys out there watching this show, please get onto WhatsApp, uh, make a video, post it out there, and send it to all the government and ministry officials because that's effectively what is happening. Is that some guy ranted on a video somewhere, put it out on uh, on WhatsApp. Forward that video to his friends, and they forward it wherever else it had to be. And some some uh, person sitting in the government that uh, of Delhi uh, well looked at that video and said, "Oh yeah, you know what? This is a very valid thing. Let us not validate this. Let us not identify. Let's not investigate what the real issue is and what is the problem. Uh, but let's uh, take uh, a car that is probably India that is India's most affordable uh, four wheeler, electric four wheeler, delisted from subsidies." Make it far more expensive to everybody in Delhi, but at the same time, we want to battle pollution. We want to reduce emission. Uh, thing. We don't want Delhi to uh, die of smog and thing. I mean, I don't understand what this bunch of jokers sits and does in Delhi. Uh, what exactly is it that you are trying to achieve here? On the one hand, you want to make sure that the pollution levels in Delhi are controllable. On the other hand, you want to make sure that EVs are far more expensive, that you earn a lot more taxes out of them. And this is not something that I mean, a customer is going to pay at the end of the day, but it's not necessarily money that Tata Motors will earn. This money that will go to the government and its coffers. So it's not like Tata Motors is going to make a lot more money over here in that sense. But delisting it is not really helping anybody. Uh, you're not going to get more people, you know, enthused about buying an Exxon EV for that matter. Even the government officials. I mean, you're giving the car and uh, on subsidy. Uh, you are ex- you're, you're, what you are saying right now is that for your purposes, for your usage, you are going to buy a far more expensive vehicle at this point in time. Well, all the best. I mean, then you'd better make, uh, you'd better buy off, uh, you'd better off buying a diesel somewhere and using mm-hmm. that because you at least get a lot more uh, mileage out of it. You get uh, longevity out of it. So that's what you do. So increase the pollution. I think that you should be very happy about uh, doing that in in city of Delhi. Now. Uh, is ARI to blame over here, or is Tata Motors to blame over here? I think yes, at some level, uh, blame also lies with both these manufacturers, with both with both these agents, with both these uh, with, the, with the organization ARI, and of course with uh, the manufacturers with Tata Motors as well. But it's not just Tata Motors who's to blame; it's every manufacturer in the country as as well, uh, because they have to publish the figures that are uh, given out by ARI. They're not allowed to publish their own figures. They're not allowed to uh, put out uh, independent figures for that matter. They have to. Uh, they have to uh, provide figures that are provided by ARI. So yes, like you said, Rohit, ARI needs to do, uh, get a bit more realistic in terms of what uh, they are providing in terms of fuel efficiency. And we have never in our any of our tests ever been able to match the fuel efficiency figures that ARI puts out. Uh, very rare occasion we've come close. Sometimes uh, it's also been that we might have better it for that matter. But uh, on most occasions, 95 to 99 percent of them. We have never been able to meet those figures, no matter how hard, what time of day we drive it at. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, Tata Motors, of course, uh, yes. Uh, again, manufacturers also to to be held equally accountable, simply because I mean that's the figure that you put out. And uh, though they do put a disclaimer, if you do notice all the mm-hmm. brochures, uh, a very clear disclaimer is put in saying that these are ARI figures. These are not figures. Uh, identified or reached by the manufacturer. These are figures that are provided by ARI. So it indemnifies them technically of all of these clauses. If the government of Delhi had an issue, it should have taken this up with the ARI, which is the testing, which is the testing organization for all vehicles in India. It's the central authority that gives out all of these figures. They test, it, they test vehicles for safety, they test vehicles for fuel efficiency, they test it for roadworthiness. All of these tests are done by ARI, and ARI certifies them homologates these cars and says, fine, now these cars can be sold on Indian roads. Uh, if you are allowing a manufacturer to sell a car on Indian roads, then obviously you have authorized it, you have allowed it. The responsibility at the end of the day lies in the area for uh, whatever uh, happens or whatever comes through with this. Uh, I mean, it's very easy today. You can get onto a random uh, thing and talk about safety and some manifest, some guys should come on and talk about safety and tell them, uh, the people out there at large, how safe some of the cars that are manufactured in India are. I'm not going to point fingers at who is and who isn't for that matter. But uh, go about, uh, I mean, and I think the Delhi government should take cognizance of that as well and then stop the sale of so, so those cars which are not, uh, you know, which are not safe any longer. Uh, so, yes, uh, I mean, this is, this is something that is absolutely uh, ridiculous in a sense. Then also there is the, the usage. And uh, a lot of these, uh, a few of these complaints, the two complaints that have come up, I'm not entirely confident that these people know uh, how and at what time is fuel efficiency tested by ARA. 
uh, this is I uh, keep in mind in my early years, my formative years, I've also worked as uh, at uh, various workshops as uh, a service attendant, and you know I have a, I have a service engineer. I have advised people and have taken people out on drives in their cars. This is back in the days, uh, in the late 90, uh, 90s. Uh, I used to work for Daewoo and Ford at that point in time at the service station, and I take people out on full efficiency drives because they would invariably come in and say, "My car does not give me the 20 kilometers per hour or 20 kilometers per liter that uh, Daewoo claims the Matisse is capable of uh, providing." I want to know why that is. That is an issue. And we test the cars, we check the cars. I mean, those they, uh, we still do. Uh, most most service stations will still do. Where they will put it on uh, uh, the, uh, the testing uh, uh, devices they've got, uh, and they will check and see. And everything you know is usually 99%. Everything is perfectly fine with the car, and there is never an issue. But when you go out and you tell people, oh, you know what, this is how you're supposed to drive at this speed, keep it in this gear. As you're climbing up a flower, drop a gear, raise a gear, go to higher gears. Usage should be much more in higher gears. That's when they realize that they're doing something wrong, and of course nobody wants to admit that they're wrong in this country. But uh, yeah, effectively the blame always falls on the manufacturer not being able to provide your production car. And this is what is going to be. What, this is essentially what is happening with the next one EV as well. Somebody who or other whoever drove the car obviously drove it in traffic conditions, has no idea how to drive the car, has no idea where to use the car. Uh, and this is the problem. ARA gives you one particular figure, and that figure cannot work anywhere. Uh, and everywhere in the country, for that matter, it is a condition that they achieve in Pune, between Pune and Bombay, or wherever they test that vehicle. That figure will change as you change location, ge geographical location will change the kind of efficiency you get from that. Humidity levels will change the efficiency figure that you get. Uh, altitude will change uh, the figures that you get. How close to sea level you are, or how how high up above sea level you are, all of these will change uh, the fuel efficiency that you achieve in a vehicle. Unfortunately, AI releases just one figure, and that is the kind of you know one price, one nation, one nation, one price kind of thing. Unfortunately, there isn't a one nation, one fuel efficiency figure. Fuel efficiency will differ from location to location. So, what the Delhi government has done essentially is gone ahead and taken a step without looking into this and understanding uh, the policy of the decision that they have made. Uh, Ridiculous, like I usually believe, I mean, people in positions of power don't, you know, really deserve them for that matter, or for people don't really deserve being where they are. But yeah, it is what it is, and you got to live with it. I'm sure there'll be a solution that will come up that will be reached at some point in time. But let's see what happens with them. But yeah, it's definitely discouraging to see that someone, uh, that the government of Delhi has come in and, uh, you know, delisted the car like that. Uh, it'll, of course, make the car more expensive for uh, people in Delhi who want this. Discourages people from buying an EV and adopting an EV in their daily lives. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. That's my sorry, 10 minutes of rant now. I have uh, one more question. That does this also discourage other manufacturers, uh, you know, who have noticed something like this happening, who are working towards getting EVs into the country, will they be more wary about advertising the ARI claimed uh, driving range? It doesn't apply only to EVs, so this, this is a generalized thing. Overall, like yeah. Vehicles, whether it's, yeah. Whether it's two-wheelers right. or four-wheelers, uh, you know, whoever is there in the market, whoever is selling a vehicle in the market, here is because are, are skewed and never accurate. Uh, and no, even the only accurate, reason it's not a one, I like said this. Not a one nation, one, uh, it's not like a one yeah. nation, one fuel efficiency figure anywhere. It will, it will differ. This is It is bound to happen. You cannot aim to achieve the same kind of efficiency uh, in every part of the country for that matter. You might get uh, a completely different fuel efficiency figure at, uh, in Kerala. You might get a completely different fuel efficiency in Pune because it's a, it sits at a higher altitude. You will get a completely different figure for people living in Manali or up north in uh, Srinagar for that matter. They will get a completely different fuel, uh, fuel efficiency figure. They will never achieve the kind of fuel efficiency. I mean, at that rate, uh, a car being driven up to Ladakh should definitely, let's assume uh, one of those compact uh, sedans for that matter, which, which claim, you know, 21, 20 to 23. I am willing to bet any car can achieve that kind of fuel efficiency figure going on the on the journey up to lay for that matter, going up going into that. I mean, we've struggled. We know what uh, kind of mileage these cars give. But then I should put out an argument and saying those manufacturers should be banned from selling their cars simply because it does not give me 23 kilometers per liter up in Ladakh. Why does it not give me that kind of fuel efficiency figure? So it's a ridiculous statement being right. made. It's a ridiculous argument being uh, bandied about. It just does not. It it, it does just does not hold any water. Uh, but yeah, it is what it is. And I mean, it took okay. just two complaints for them to deal. It took exactly. just two complaints to delist a car off that subsidy really list. Just two complaints. No veracity of those complaints, no verifications, no authentication done, no background checks done, nothing whatsoever. 
straight off delisted. So obviously there is something that larger at play over here. Uh, not just those two companies, and somebody was just waiting for an opportunity to take the Tata Nexon off the subsidy list. But yeah, this is the automotive industry. This is how it works. Everyone's at each other's throats. Everyone's cutting each other's throats. Uh, you know, cutting them in the back and doing all sorts of shit. But yeah, it is what it is. Okay. So, in fact, in fact um... let, me, let me tell you. Let me tell you. I think I think it's a good platform to also tell you. Uh, before just before the domestic notice came or notification became popular, and everybody kind of latched onto it. Was sent to me by another manufacturer who very you know. Uh, very, very, uh, how would I say it, uh, eagerly kind of uh, sent it to me and said, oh, you know what, you saw this and uh, this car is not deserving of whatever it has accolated as one and, uh, you know, it should not, uh, thing. how has this happened? And I told him, sir, you sell an EV as well or other things, you are also looking at selling an EV and you are also looking at the same thing and your fuel efficiency figures also, I am willing to bet that none of the cars that you sell in this market uh, are able to achieve the kind of ARI fuel efficiency. If I had to take it up to Delhi, if I had to drive it up to Manali, Go further up to Lay or in Kerala or whatever, and that shut him up. Uh, uh, I don't know whether we should just follow up on this uh, conversation because we do have a um, gentleman here saying that uh, manufacturers should so uh, state the real so world, world mileage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you're allowed to, at this point in time. Uh, the government does not allow you to put out your independent, like I mentioned, do not allow to put out independent figures. Uh, you have to put out ARAI certified figures alone, and that's essentially the issue that exists at this point in time, uh, which is why a lot of manufacturers face this challenge. Like Rohit also pointed out, Hyundai wanted to do this when they launched the Kona. They were quite surprised, and they were scared also that most of the customers who take the car would come back with complaints saying that their cars were not able to achieve the kind of fuel efficiency figures that were published. But those published figures are the only figures manufacturers are allowed to give out and they're not allowed to do their own independent testing and give out real world figures uh, or figures for different regions and areas also for that matter uh, will rush you. Right. He's just saying that it's it's basically like what MG also does. They also state its real life mileage figure uh, a plus or minus uh, 20 is what he's saying. So he's saying that could also be added, but that's just like, it's up to the manufacturers, right? In fact, let me just well, say I, that... I, I, I genuinely uh, like is... to see an MG ZSCV also reach 300 to 400 to 340 kilometers. I would, I would genuinely like to see it achieve that kind of thing. Yeah. In fact, I would say this is the reason why you need to follow all our road tests because that is essentially what we do. The reason why we do a separate road test for every vehicle is to give you an idea, a general idea of what the real world figure should ideally look like. Of course, like Bert said, uh, these are also going to vary because where we test is the Bombay Pune Highway. Uh, Bert and I were just recently discussing the same thing where, uh, you know, this is still a very uh, nice wide highway where you can maintain a cruising speed. And that doesn't necessarily hold true for the rest of the country. There are more congested highways in the country. The fuel economy figures that we would publish as highway figures. Uh, would be a little bit higher maybe than uh, what uh, you know the rest of the country could get on uh, the more congested highways uh, same with the city figures uh, we are testing these cars in bombay which is known for its bumper to bumper traffic so the city figures that we might get uh, might actually be lower than what you might get in your city uh, if the traffic is not as bad uh, as uh, what we have in bombay so or in mumbai so you know uh, these uh, figures vary but what we are trying to give you here is a more uh, a real world a more realistic uh, figure in terms of uh, the fuel economy, in terms of its everyday use. And that is why these road tests are important. So when you are making your informed decisions about buying cars, definitely do take a look at these figures. Just walk around reviews and showroom reviews are not what you want to uh, look at. You need to look at these figures as well. They are important. It's also essential, it's also essential that you ask around uh, with your peers and colleagues and family, friends, whoever is there, who might have a particular product that you would want to buy. And find out from them also what is the kind of mileage that they're getting because that's that's the closest indicator you would get in that geographical area uh, as to what that car is capable of delivering. Uh, because let's uh, let's 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 uh, understand one thing clearly: not everybody has uh, the right style of driving. Not everyone understands the correct style of driving. A lot of people have noticed, you know, instead of going into first gear, for instance, it put into second gear in a manual car and then burn the clutch and try to accelerate. Uh, you don't drive in a straight line, you're constantly cutting through traffic. And a classic example of this, let me just put this into perspective as well. Uh, if you are driving in a straight line, absolutely straight line, you would get the best fuel efficiency, but we don't often do that. Trying to get uh, ahead, we effectively move two degrees to the right, we cut three lanes and then come back. And 
if you calculate this in maths, of course, you calculate it, that distance that you travel going left to right and you know doing this constantly means you're traveling a longer distance. You might assume in your head that your place of work is five kilometers. Where, I, however, you would have probably done six kilometers simply because you kept changing lanes and veering right to left and going in between, you know, doing this whole uh, trying to dodge traffic for that matter. You will have certainly uh, covered a larger distance, and that larger distance effectively tells on your fuel efficiency. So, when you calculate at the end of the month, instead of having driven, generally driven, you haven't driven 500 kilometers, you would have driven a little longer. Uh, you would have put no more distance and you'd say, oh, you know what, my fuel got over so fast, I only went to office 10 times and uh, this time I got, you know, less of fuel efficiency and all that stuff. You need to, people need to examine this and understand that, uh, yeah, it's driving habits also largely that are to blame uh, and driving conditions as well that contribute to, to reducing your fuel efficiency. In fact, the easiest that way is. to, uh, you know, validate what Bert just said is, do a Google map uh, navigation from your place, uh, you know, to the destination. And, uh, you know, run a check between the kilometers that Google showed you versus the kilometers on your odometer. And you will immediately understand what Bert is saying that, you know, just taking those uh, extra lane changes into consideration, you're actually traveling more. Uh, and that is where, you know, calculations can also be a little uh, wrong uh, for a lot of people who are just calculating purely on the basis of, you know, uh, the map, uh, the map location or distances. Yeah, where are shoes come back over here uh, again? You are saying stating uh, Hyundai lied in its figure of 452 kilometers in a single charge. Whereas in the UK, Hyundai has stated real world mileage of 270 to 300 kilometers for the same battery pack. And that's exactly what we just said, where are uh, Hyundai at the time of launch of the Kona was very scared about giving out that figure because that's the figure they are mandated to provide. Uh, that's the figure that the area deems you need to publish. And uh, these are incorrect figures, and unfortunately, this is what happens. The real world figure is about 200 and what actually it varies also between 240 to 270 under 300 kilometers. In some countries, they are also able to get 320 kilometers uh, on the same uh, in the same car. But uh, yeah, in here in India, Hyundai was also fearful of uh, giving others uh, giving out the mileage that area I claimed, uh, but they had to. Uh, it's mandatory for them to do that. So unfortunately, this is uh, this is the state of affairs in this country. All right, Vela uh, Rishu, let's... Why are you challenging me? Uh, challenging, why are you challenging, <laughs> are you challenging speaker to speak up the next something at least 270 kilometers of a single charge in real yeah. conditions. Uh, Rohit, what was the range that you achieved uh, when you were testing the car? Uh, for the Kona, we actually haven't uh, done a road test. No, for yet. the Nexon. Uh, Nexon, Nexon. For the Nexon, yes. Uh, Nexon was about 110 kilometers, if I'm not wrong. That's uh, what we got before the batteries uh, were almost down to 0%. I think there was about 12% uh, battery remaining or something of that sort uh, when we reached back at uh, Tata's facility. Uh, and this, of course, was, uh, you know, it involved a little bit of mountain roads. It involved a little bit of testing here and there. So it was a combination of all of that. And, uh, you know, uh, that is why we said that, yes, there could be a 200 kilometer range that was possible. Uh, but the moment you uh, change your driving dynamics from a regular city use uh, or a regular highway use, there's a drastic change in the range that you're going to get. And it's not it's not down to only the Nexon. It's also uh, true for any other uh, electric vehicle for that matter. Uh, so, you know, that is uh, that's exactly what the problem here is. And uh, uh, yeah, those ARI figures then become a little too optimistic. Because depending on your driving style, depending on all the peripherals within the car that you're using, air conditioning, uh, audio, every all of that starts telling on the range as well. More so uh, on an EV compared to uh, a regular uh, ICE, uh, you know, an uh, internal combustion engine car. So yeah, that is that is the issue. All right, uh, we'll uh, carry on with the other news from this week. Uh, if you have any more questions regarding uh, the Nexon, uh, Beto, you all can uh, send us uh, your questions in the comment section or you can tweet to Bert and Rohit and they will get back to you. Moving on, BMW India has started accepting bookings of its first ever locally assembled M performance model, the M340i xDrive, exclusively via the BMW online shop from today. With limited units set to be available to book online for a sum of 1 lakh rupees, the first 40 customers will also be offered a curated driver training course at an iconic Indian racetrack with BMW certified trainers on hand to help owners safely explore the limits of their new cars. As for the pricing, we're told a price tag of uh, between 65 to 70 lakh rupees is expected with the launch of the BMW M340i, which is scheduled for uh, March 10th. Our detailed review uh, is up uh, across our various social media platforms. So do check out Simran's uh, review after this show, though. Uh, 
Moving on, we haven't had a chance to talk about the new Renault Kaido. Bert and Rohit drove it last uh, weekend in Goa. Reviews are up on our YouTube website, uh, on our YouTube channel as well as on the Overdrive website. This compact crossover seems to have made quite a mark already. Renault has delivered uh, 1,100 units of the Kaido on the first day of the sales already. Uh, Bert, Rohit, uh, anything else you would like to I, uh, add about the Kaigo? Uh, you know, even for our viewers, if you'll have any questions about the Kaigo, here's your chance to ask Bert and Rohit about it. Well, I'm quite impressed with the package uh, and uh, it, it's been a very impressive product overall. You've seen uh, the comparison story also. That's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of value. What I do like about the fact is that Renault is trying to, right, try to pack in a lot of features into this product uh, and that uh, enhances the value for it at the end of the day. Uh, the ride quality, the performance, I mean, this and the magnet feel almost the same uh, or at least very, very similar to each other in terms of performance and uh, drivability, even the ride quality, super bright quality. I must say, I'm very impressed with the kind of ride quality that the Tiger is uh, delivers. Uh, uh, is there something that, uh, you know, um, how would I say, that, that is lacking? Uh, not really. I think it's, it is impressive. In fact, it is so impressive uh, that uh, it came pretty close, pretty close to the, it would come pretty close to the venue and the sonnet also if it were uh, to be compared outright uh, to them. I don't think it would win simply because of the kind of premiumness that you get in the venue or the sonnet. Uh, and even though all of these lie in the sub 4 meter uh, category, uh, the Renault has, uh, the Renault Kaiser is, uh, is damn impressive. All right, and finally, uh, one piece of good news coming in from the Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways. You will now be able to renew your driving license, apply for a learner's license, duplicate license application, address change, apply for an international driving permit, or even apply for a temporary registration for a motor vehicle online based on your Aadhaar authentication. You do not need to visit your uh, local RTO anymore. So no more crowding at RTOs. You will now just be a click away from getting your permit smoothly. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's you... pretty good, you know, because this will help us a lot because uh, especially automotive journalists who keep traveling overseas, when overseas travel starts, of course, because of the whole international license that we need to apply for every year. And uh, that's a huge challenge where you have to kind of spend that one day going down to the RTO, getting your license uh, applied for. Oh, you do get it by the same day, by the evening, you get the license back. But uh, this will make things a lot easier if you can just do this application online. Same with the driving license renewal as well. Even though you have to renew it for every 10 years, uh, it makes a lot more sense to kind of uh, get this process done online. It only really makes matters far easier. I think along with this now, uh, uh, the, the government also needs to kind of uh, build these frameworks like Maruti does with its testing center in uh, Delhi. They've got a fantastic testing center. And it genuinely evaluates the ability of a person to drive a car because some of those tests, I've done a story on this quite some time ago, and the kind of tests that exist over there, whether it's, you know, driving forwards, reverse, uh, stopping on an incline, starting off from there, reversing through a small loop, uh, all of these things that are there, it kind of tests, it genuinely tests the ability of a driver to understand how, not just, un, not just know how to drive a car, but understand how it, a car is supposed to be driven. I think this is what the government should uh, focus on next. Uh, increasing these kind of test centers around the country before driving licenses are issued. All right. Um, I think, uh, Rohit, you can take us through the motorcycle news from this week. Rohit, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Uh, so, I think uh, let's uh, begin We've with there only two launches. Think... Yeah, we seem okay. to have lost your visual. Ah, there you are. Oh, yeah, there. Oh, I think, uh, yeah, I think my network's a little weak. Uh, it's it's sort of pausing uh, every now and then. Anyway, so motorcycle news, uh, there are only uh, two launches that happened. Uh, you know, that's that's the big uh, uh, thing that uh, needs to be talked about. A lot of you asked us about the Ninja 300. When is that coming out? And it's the A6 Avatar. Well, it's finally here. Uh, it is priced at about 3.18 lakh rupees. Uh, uh, it's available in two color options. There are no mechanical changes as such in terms of uh, numbers, in terms of uh, the performance. Uh, though we'll have to verify that with a road test, but at least on spec, uh, there are no changes uh, apart from, of course, the BA6 conversion that has happened. Uh, so at 3.18 lakh rupees, uh, you know, I think it's also priced pretty well uh, right now uh, compared to, you know, where uh, the KTMs are and uh, where its competition is. So I think 3.18 lakh is not a bad price. 
uh, and that is uh, that is the uh, the main launch of uh, this week. The other launch is uh, the Platina. Uh, the Bajaj Platina is now uh, you know back in uh, its updated avatar. There is that SNS suspension, the spring and spring suspension that is uh, quite touted for this. It's launched at about fifty three thousand nine hundred twenty, and the suspension that I was talking about. It's also got. Uh, slightly longer travel now in fact 20 percent more travel at the front and the rear to make it uh, uh, you know more enduring on our road conditions uh, so these are the two uh, main launches that's uh, that's uh, pretty much the motorcycle news uh, for this week uh, so two ends uh, uh, so to say one is a premium motorcycle the other is a very fuel efficient uh, commuter so yeah these are the two motorcycle uh, news that we have for you this week all right, we'll get back to our uh, questions then. Sahil has been waiting for a really lo long time. He wants to know the fifth generation Honda City has scored uh, five star in the uh, ASEAN NCAP. Is it the same which is selling in India because Honda has given in uh, given this in their brochure? Also, platform is the same or not? He also wants to know what about uh, the build quality uh, of the car, although it has uh, all the active safety features standard, but uh, he's asked for some some foreign YouTubers or reviewers that they say the build quality of the city in their country is excellent. Well, I think the uh, build quality was never a concern on that uh, new Honda City. We've reviewed that car in uh, great detail, and it was never a concern. Uh, you know, the build quality is on par uh, or even better than uh, some of its rivals in that particular segment right now. And as far as uh, the Asian. Uh, the ASEAN uh, NCAP rating is concerned. Uh, yes, this is the same car, the same spec that comes to India in the top of the line uh, variant, of course. Uh, that is the one that has the same set of safety features as uh, the car that was tested uh, by the NCAP. So, uh, probably what those two stars on their brochure mean, uh, are the, or the two, two asterisk signs on the brochure essentially means is that uh, it is for the top of the line variant with all the safety features in place and may not be the same case for the lower end trims. That is essentially what it uh, what it means but i think it's an excellent car the platform is of course the same it's not uh, it's not a different uh, car than uh, what is uh, sold in the rest of the asian uh, markets right now it's the same car that is sold in india it's the same car that is sold uh, in the uh, asian markets as well a few features here and there could be different uh, market specific of course but apart from that the uh, the build quality the platform the engines it's all the same all right, I have to what mention I would, this. What I would like to know on that, what I would like to know on the ASEAN NCAP, however, Rose, is if it was an India specification, not in, it was an India specific car that was tested, was crash tested, and not one from uh, from Thailand or from somewhere else in. Uh, no, it wasn't uh, the Indian car, car, of course. Uh, it's not the Indian exactly. cars that go for. And uh, that's the question that I will raise because we definitely know for a fact that a lot of Indian cars do not use the same gauge of strength of steel as some of the other countries uh, that are around us, also for that matter. Right. Some of the cars that are sold in Malaysia or Thailand uh, definitely use either better, sometimes even worse, of uh, grades of steel to build these cars. So it's not a, it's not the exact indicator. That five star rating is not uh, is not. Uh, a reflective indicator of what the car could be capable of. Maybe an India-specific car also would achieve uh, a five-star rating, but I think uh, this is something that only time will tell us. And when, right. as and when, ARAI has a more uh, robust uh, crash testing facility in place, facility. which can yeah. give us crash, crash uh, rating as well. Tony, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah. I think it's very interesting after this entire conversation that you had, Bert, he said that he would, uh, he has nothing against the Tatas and he would really want to buy the Nexon EV. So, well, uh, Virashu, even I was very impressed with the, with the Nexon EV and uh, I mean, uh, I think I'm quite uh, proud of the fact that, uh, you know, the Nexon EV won uh, the green car of the year. So it's, it's very important today if you're going to be moving in the future towards uh, electric vehicles, it's very important. To, be, to make far more affordable electric vehicles for more people to adopt them quickly and uh, bring down prices for whether it's batteries or for charging units or for the car itself. So I think it's it's, it's essential that we have more manufacturers like uh, Tata Motors who step into this space and rather than discouraging them, find a solution. Uh, you know, uh, don't just, uh, if, if necessary, don't just slap them on the wrist and take a little more strict action against them. I think as a, uh, on the whole, this needed to be investigated a little better and uh, then some punitive action taken against uh, Tata Motors or whoever is responsible for uh, releasing or for providing those uh, those figures, uh, those EV efficiency figures. Uh, we definitely need more real-world condition figures, but it, like I said earlier, it's not only possible everywhere. There are going to be differences across the country and most of these reports that uh, came in were from the Delhi region where the figures will differ vastly. 
All right, we have a question, uh, Rohit here from Shantanu. He wants to know any upcoming cafe racers. Ah uh, well, there's already one out in the market, the newest one, the Honda CB three fifty RS road sailing, as they like to call it. Uh, that's uh, you know sort of uh, coming close there to that uh, cafe racer concept. Uh, there is the new Java forty two point two as well. Uh, so these are the two uh, new entrants, uh, so to say. Uh, but uh, is that the price bracket that you are asking about, or are you talking about anything higher? Because if you are, then uh, the Thruxton is not coming back. Unfortunately, uh, Triumph India has axed that product from their lineup uh, because it had uh, hardly received any uh, interest from the Indian audience. So that motorcycle is certainly not coming back. Uh, Ducati has the new line of Scramblers. Uh, there will be the Scrambler Cafe Racer variant as well, and uh, all that uh, will be available uh, this year. Uh, and in, in fact, that should happen anytime soon now. So yeah, I hope I've answered that query. But if there is any specific price bracket that you are looking at, uh, do let us know. That's exactly the price bracket. Uh, so any, hang on, hang on, hang on. So any, hang on. Hmm. So I, I have noticed, I have noticed. There's a PR guy who's sitting there in the audience and watching this, and who's posted a question. I'm not going to take any names, but I see you, my friend. <laughs> and I'm not sure if you are here trying to figure out. Uh, I can see the questions also pointed out exactly towards the product you're representing. Isn't that right? So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to take any names. I'll bring it to you all guys later after we go offline. Uh, but uh, yes, we've got someone in the audience who's watching from the manufacturer side to see just how and where we respond. <laughs> right. <laughs> Anyway, so Shantanu, coming back to your question, uh, you know, something up to 5 lakh rupees. Uh, well, uh, there is nothing apart from what I've just said. There is the updated version of the Continental GT that will come out. Uh, it will have the tripper navigation, new color schemes, uh, a few tuning changes here and there, but that's about it. So, uh, you know, uh, that's that's the only uh, other cafe racer that's on the horizon, uh, so to say. Uh, but, you know, there's nothing else uh, at the moment. This is, this is it, the Java 42.2. Uh, the Honda CB350 RS, that upcoming uh, updated intercept, uh, the Interceptor and the uh, Continental GT650. And of course, like I said, the new Scrambler lineup, but that's going to be uh, way beyond uh, the 5 lakh rupee uh, target that you are setting. Uh, he has also asked, when will it be launched, the GT? The GT uh, should be anytime now. In fact, uh, you know, we've uh, just sort of seen some uh, leaked brochures of the updated colors uh, on the GT and the Interceptor. Uh, so it should be anytime now. Uh, like we had uh, pointed out on multiple occasions, we even said it uh, in our Himalayan review that uh, uh, Royal Enfield wants to launch a new motorcycle every quarter that includes updated models as well. Uh, so that Interceptor update, I think, should be anytime now. Uh, there's also that uh, cruiser based on the 650cc platform that is expected uh, sometime soon. But I think the updated Interceptor and uh, Conti GT will uh, come before that uh, Cruiser comes out. All right, we many, just have uh, time. We've got one viewer. I know we've taken a We've really gone overboard on uh, the Monica yeah. Defendership. But yeah, there's one question I think who's the one uh, viewer who's been asked, what's on your planet, Thanos, who's been asking Ford Aspire versus Desire. And I'm very much love that Thanos. It's right there, <laughs> but uh, don't, don't, don't. Uh, don't reduce the population enough, but uh, I would say neither uh, for this answer. Don't don't go to either Ford Aspire versus the Desire. Neither of them. Uh, there's if you're looking for a four meter vehicle, then there are better choices. There are the SUVs that are better. They make a lot more, which are far more practical, better ride quality also. Uh, and uh, unless unless and specifically you want to use them for a very particular use, uh, purpose that you want to use either of these Aspire or Desire for. Uh, otherwise, it is the Kyger as a magnet, both good SUVs, read a comparison review on them, and you'll figure out which is the best one over there and what fits your bill. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, there's the Desire, there's the Hyundai Aura as well, you no know, contemporary. Uh, you haven't mentioned any price requirements uh, for that matter, uh, what's earlier, but uh, yeah, these are, these are the options I think that you should look for. All right. But uh, Rohit, there are many questions. And since you guys have uh, missed out on two weeks, I think after the show, you have to sit and answer each of these questions for our viewers so that they can come back next time happy. So that's what you guys have to do. And we'll just wrap up the show, though. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, we, let's just check out what's on television tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, just a quick teaser. We have the A-Class review, uh, which we uh, showed you uh, a while back. Uh, catch up with it tomorrow. We've also checked out Ether's larger production facility in Hosur, Tamil Nadu. And we fit the TVS Apache RTR 204V against the Honda Hornet. Don't forget to tune in at 1 p.m. tomorrow on CNBC TV 18.
That's it, guys. And until next time, stay healthy, drive, or ride safe. So maybe, ma'am, someone likes this scale model collection in the background that uh, that's there. So I'm sure next uh, very soon. Possible. Sure. <laughs> we, uh, um, lucky viewer. Never. It, don't 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 uh, deny that. Bro. Don't don't uh, <laughs> decline the request. <laughs> Come on, God, I'm sure you can do you, something. You guess. You guess the scale models, and you might uh, get a chance to win it. You can't guess if you don't get it. <laughs> I, 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 will you will you will you give it to me if I guess them? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll see everybody next week. Then. All right, guys. Thanks so All much guys. for joining us. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you for joining in and keep us questions coming. Uh, send them out on uh, Udrai's Twitter feed. Uh, also, Rohit and my uh, Twitter feed for that matter, and we'll reply to them. At least I'm largely on Twitter and not much on the other social media feeds. But yeah, do talk in your questions. You can also send an email to Bertrand at overdrive.co.in. Uh, keep watching the show. And uh, yeah, have a nice weekend. See you. See you. Bye.